Oh man. Battery is all out of here. I have a feeling I'm going to lose my voice this program. Okay. <clears throat> all right, good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome to Rock Creek Park. Welcome to February 2020. Uh, this uh, uh, program was actually scheduled for a couple weeks ago, but we had a little bit of inclement weather. Dave and I went out there and we were slipping and sliding around. So it's wonderful to have everyone out here today. Yeah, man. Including four legged friends as well. Uh, we welcome four legged friends. Just keep them on the leash, please. Uh, my name is Steve Fan. I'm a park ranger and historian for the Civil War Defenses of Washington. If you've got to know the Civil War Defenses of Washington over the last couple years, by my side, as always, is my partner in crime, David Lowe. He is a National Park Service historian. And he's the one that created all those wonderful maps that our people are sharing and that we'll be using throughout the program. We have a guest appearance by my friend, come on up here, sir. Bob Molesky will be talking about, uh, he's a wonderful uh, historian that lives in the area and he's done a lot of research on the civilian landowners that own property where the forts were built during the Civil War. Wait till you hear this account that he uh, found in the National Archives of the gentleman that owned the property at uh, where Fort DeRussi was built absolutely incredible there's a lot of in-depth context that we can talk about moving forward here so kind of a safety talk we'll be mostly staying on trail throughout the program as we head uh, north towards military road we'll cross the street head up to fort jerusi uh, talk about the earthworks there and then we're going to shift door down um east towards we'll be going downhill on trail towards battery uh, kingsbury we'll see battery left of rock creek we're actually gonna cross the creek and we're gonna show you the remnants of Battery Sill, which we rediscovered last year. So we're very excited to show you. Um, keep an open imagination when you get out there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we just went out there recently and um, there's a lot of in invasive plants and kind of brush covering them, but we were able to find the remnants. And by looking at these maps, uh, we had one of our interns a couple of summers ago to go to the National Archives with our friend Brandy here. She digitized about 800 original engineering blueprints. And Dave's been able to play with those maps, superimpose them, work with LiDAR. So we've been rediscovering earthworks that we thought were gone 150 years ago. So this is very, very exciting. And we're very, very happy, uh, excuse me, to have, have you all here today. So stay on the trails if anyone needs to get water use the restroom real quick the nature center is right there program will be a little over two hours about two and a half mile hike as i said mostly on dirt or paved paths are there any questions so far okay my friends so this is the first major outdoor program of 2020 so we're excited to have you with the civil war defenses of washington as i said i'm ranger steve my buddy Dave and Bob here and we'll be taking you throughout Rock Creek Park so 150 plus years ago this would have been the countryside when they started building the forts in this area mostly after the Battle of First Manassas in July of 1861 a lot of these forts will go up in August September October into the fall of 1861 by the end of 1861 there will be about 48 Civil War forts encircling Washington DC and that number will expand dramatically over the course of the Civil War. So I'm gonna show you this map in a second, but what I want you to understand and what you're gonna see on the program here is the evolution of the defenses of Washington. They're gonna get bigger, they're gonna add bigger guns, they're gonna expand. And the reason why they do that is the federal engineers and the soldiers in Washington DC are responding to what's going on on the battlefield. So operations in and around Virginia, into Maryland, and obviously Pennsylvania in 1863, the federal engineers are responding to what's going on. So you're going to see a system of forts over the course of about four years expand dramatically. From 48 forts to about 60 by 1863. By the end of the Civil War, there's about 68 major forts that encircle Washington. And we're going to be talking specifically about batteries or artillery positions there's going to be 93 of those around the city as well. We're mounting about 800 artillery pieces. So when we talk about one of the most heavily fortified cities in the world, this is what we're talking about. So this is quite exciting and we look forward to show this to everyone. Okay, so one of the things you're going to see on this map here, they call this area the Northern Defenses. They're shielding Washington, D.C. from Maryland. So Maryland is a border state. 
They stay in the United States or the Union when the Civil War begins, but they still allow slavery. That will change in 1864 when abolished, when slavery, excuse me, is abolished in the state of Maryland. But the immediate fear for the federal soldiers in high command is Virginia, specifically the Arlington Heights. If you go to Arlington National Cemetery, right in front of the, the, the Arlington House or the Lee property, just look north across the Potomac River and you, there's a wonderful view or vista of Washington, D.C. Federal engineers were afraid that the Confederate Army would roll up artillery and shell the capital city. So beginning in May of 1861, when they realized that Virginia will indeed secede from the Union, federal troops crossed the Potomac River on May 21st, 22nd, 1861. And the next day, they start building forts. So as early as 1861 of May, they're going to start constructing the defenses of Washington. And after the Battle of First Manassas, which becomes a Union route, and they retreat back to Washington, D.C., that's when you're going to see the major expansion of the defenses of Washington. Does that make sense? So there's going to be three major sectors here. My friends, you got Virginia. I'm going to point it out and kind of walk around. And they call this the Arlington Line. The Arlington Line will extend all the way down to Alexandria. So the zone of immediate threat will be Northern Virginia. The Confederate Army is in that area through most of 1861. And when they retreat towards the capital of Richmond, that will change the strategic pressure on the federal armies here. Okay, the next sector is what we're going to be talking about. They call these the northern defenses, and the northern defenses will become increasingly more important over the course of the Civil War. So anything north of the Potomac River is what we're talking about here. an elaborate system of fortifications, which you'll see here. And there's one more zone here. They called it the zone of least threat, and that's on the eastern branch side. Think about the Anacostia River. They did not call it the Anacostia River. They called it eastern branch of the Potomac. And think of Oxen Hill and the Frederick Douglass House and Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. Everything on the southeast side of Washington, D.C. is the third zone. And the reason why there are fortifications on that side, because there's a long ridge line that parallels the river there, a couple hundred feet high, and the fear is that the Confederate Army will come in and shell the Federal Arsenal and Navy Yard. So you can see there's a system of fortification completely encircling Washington, D.C. So we've got the secondary zone here, which is the northern defenses, and that will become the primary zone by 1862 into 1863. Are there any questions? All right, my friends. Dave, you want to add anything? Yes. No, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so I said we're going to be moving. Just follow us along the trail. And we must, I guess we've got to start with this gentleman right here before we proceed forward. This is the patron saint of the defenses of Washington. This is John G. Barnard. He is the chief engineer of the defenses of Washington, and it will be under his supervision. The forts will be designed, constructed, and expanded throughout the course of the Civil War. Uh, West Pointer, absolutely brilliant. He's an engineer, and it's really interesting. Every time the Army goes and takes the field, he accompanies the Army. But when the Confederate Army starts moving towards Washington, they send him back. Okay. So you're going to see him come back actually a couple of times during the course of the Civil War. And like a very difficult teacher, he's almost impossible to please. He's never happy with the defenses of Washington, but they do their job. If there are no questions, we're going to... Yes, go ahead. Was Military Road built at the time of the Civil War? It was. Or was there a road there before the Civil War? We were trying to figure that out. There, there was some sort of country farmland. Did, did he find anything there? Milkhouse Ford Road. Which is a little bit north of the yeah, fort. Yeah, okay. like not where we are. Not where Military Yeah, road so uh, there was a, a farmland that's, that fronts north of Fort Jerusi. But one of the things that we want uh, visitors and the public to recognize is the importance of names. We're going up to Military Road. The Army built over 30 miles of military roads encircling the city, mostly behind the forts and earthworks to move men and supplies. So you're going to see that. You're actually going to see where the original route of military road will take. Um, it kind of runs along that line there south of St. John College High School and Fort Jerusi. 
but it's going to curve actually further south instead of headed directly towards Georgia Avenue. We're going to follow in that route of Military Road there, okay? All right, friends, follow me, and we're going to hit the trail. <laughs> In 2017, because we work with three national parks in the region, we work with Rock Creek Park, uh, National Capital Parks east across the Anacostia River, and George Washington Memorial Parkway. We had had maybe two, three, sometimes four people on the programs. So to see a girl like this, it's uh, incredibly humbling, and I appreciate everyone being out here today. So, all right, I will speak up. Yes. Okay. So I want everyone to kind of look around, uh, look at the park. Top poggers be here, and I'm going to orient orientate everyone to kind of what we're going to be looking at. Okay, so Military Road is south of us. North of us will be Maryland. To our east, as you can see, it go downhill is Rock Creek or the Valley. It descends down into the Valley, which is critically important as we go up to see the fortifications and earthworks here. All right, so. North Maryland, the Confederate Army, by the way, will be coming this direction in 1864, and the earthworks in this area will be engaged in battle. So not only are you seeing the, the remnants of the defenses of Washington, you are actually going to see sites that saw action in 1864. There's going to be heavy fighting in front of Fort Jerusi during the Battle of Fort Stevens, and with the um, with the noise of the road here, we're going to shut the ship up into the woods here and. Talk a little bit more, okay? So follow me up there. Well, Dave, go ahead. Along the original uh, military road, that, or branch of the military road that they, they, they built to go up to the fort. You're dealing with heavy artillery here, so anytime you see a fortification, there has to be a road up to it. So our, our park trail follows the original uh, road that the uh, soldiers used to get their artillery up into the fort. So, uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. One thing I want everyone to notice as we go up is watch how the terrain changes or the elevation as we go uphill and you'll start to understand why they built the fortifications where they were at, okay? No more helicopters. And we just watched for what? A couple hundred feet? Look where we're at. I mean, we're literally on the crest of the hill as we extend. So, we're gonna give you a couple unique perspectives here as I project my voice. Uh, the military perspective, and my friend Bob, who's done so much research on the civilian experience here, will talk specifically about the landowner that owned the property where uh, Fort Jerusi was built and some of these outer earthworks, including uh, Battery Smead is located right where St. John College High School is at and will be engaged during the battle. Uh, we'll talk specifically more about batteries as we move forward in the program here. So let's get back to this gentleman right here. I guess the good thing about the military in war is they have to write a lot of reports. And so we've got a lot of primary source material to reflect upon and digest as we move into and create these programs here. But I want you to listen to this in regards to the construction of the forts in early 1861, beginning in May, as I said, accelerating by August, September of 1861. And you can really understand that specifically with this area here. <coughs> Uh, and I'll read it slowly, and this is what General Barnard wrote to meet the emergency. Remember, see, this is a national emergency. Works were necessarily thrown up without that deliberate study of the topography on which the establishment of such a defensive line should, if practical, be used. Hey, so we just got to build these forts, and then we'll go from there. The first directions given to our laborers, which were mostly soldiers, were to secure the roads, not merely as the beaten highways of travel from the country to the city, but as, in general, occupying the best ground for the enemy's approach. So that's what they're doing. They're coming up to high ground. They're going to be cutting down trees. They're going to be building. You can see the fort actually right in front of us there, folks. Those are the earthworks. That's why we call these earthworks. The forts are made out of two major material here, earth, and they're going to be reinforced with... of the ground. That will change by the end of 1862. So that's the military experience and we'll talk about Fort Jerusi as we get closer to it. But I want Bob to talk about the civilian experience here as well. 
Well, one thing General Barnard said was that when they chose the locations of the forts, they did it out of military necessity, which took over any other possibility. So the people who owned this land had no choice. They had no complaint uh, to make other than in words. They had no recourse to reclaim their land in any way. So these 200 acres were owned by a man named Barnard Swart, S-W-A-R-T. He bought 200 acres in around 1855. He grew corn and potatoes and a little wheat and timber. He had large stains of timber going all the way down to the creek. Timber was valuable before the war. It was incredibly valuable during the war. So he had no choice. His house was where St. John's College High School is now. The fort was here at the northern end of his property. Battery Smead, they built on his doorstep. It was literally 20 feet from his front door. Now, a lot of landowners abandoned their property during the war, figuring, I can't use it, I might as well go somewhere else. Barney Swart decided to stay here and try and at least grow a few things. He didn't have a lot of luck. Do you have the letter? I have it all Okay. So, am I loud enough? No. No. <laughs> Hard to get louder. Okay. Before he reads this, I want you to concentrate specifically on the major themes that Swart is going to be talking about. And by the way, he's writing to Montgomery Meigs, the quartermaster general of the army, the gentleman that designed the Capitol Dome and the National Building Museum, and will be in charge of the government clerks at the Battle of Fort Stevens, his shining military uh, moment. He's the Quartermaster General. He is tasked with supplying the troops with all their equipment, the stuff that they need to survive as soldiers in and around Washington. And this was what, written December 15th, 1862, which means the forts are beginning to be expanded all the way up to the front doorstep of his property here. And I want you to listen closely and we'll discuss what this letter means. It, it implicates quite a bit. Go ahead, sir. Dear sir, though I understand that Congress contemplates making compensation for damages that have been done private property in the District of Columbia by military occupation during the war, I am compelled by absolute necessity to call upon you, not for damages, but redress. The statements of the facts in my case is as follows. My farm has been taken possession of for the construction of forts, batteries, rifle pits, and military roads, under a military necessity of which I do not complain. My farm has been in the constant successive occupation of troops and laboring parties so that my efforts at cultivation have been rendered futile. Fort de Russie is located on the most prominent part of it, flanked on both sides by batteries, one of which is located immediately at my front door. <laughs> In addition to these, half a mile of rifle pits have been dug, and fully two miles of roads laid out in every direction through it, cutting through the heart of my lands and leaving them in a shapeless condition. The same military necessity has caused the timber on my woodland to be felled and has forbidden me to derive from the timber thus cut the only means that has been left me to support my family. It does not seem to me that the same pleas of military necessity can be urged against my desire to retrieve the loss of my property or can justify the destruction before my eyes by soldiers and contrabands of the very wood whose use would be to me a means of support in which, though my own property, I am forbidden to touch or even to use for fuel on my own heart. It is unnecessary for me to amplify the injuries. The means of redress is in your hands. The government has taken so complete a possession as to prevent me from using my farm, and it is therefore only fair that I should ask for rent, which I consider as due me in return for such possession. 
Should I read no, that's good. <laughs> so he did. He filed a war claim, and he was uh, uh, surprisingly actually given three thousand dollars for uh, the rental of his land for the four years. Is that a lot of money? Not not half enough <laughs> for the damage he, he under underwent. Uh, actually, the war claim went to a total of $10,000 and, and the government said, yes, we owe you $10,000. They paid him $3,000 for rent and didn't pay the rest. It wasn't until after the war, Swart became an uh, active member of the Democratic Party and he had some clout and because he had clout, he was able to petition the Senate who therefore brought up before the Senate that this man had not been paid. So in 1884, 20 years after the end of the war, he got an extra $5,000. Wow. Right, one question. Sounds like they mentioned contraband. Was there a slave community, <laughs> slave community here? There was not a slave community, escape but slave. contrabands that is escaped slaves and others would congregate to the forts. They seemed like the safest place. Now, I should also note that Bar Barney Swart was a slave owner. He had five slaves. He probably rented the men out uh, to help build the fort. So he, he earned no warmth from the soldiers because he was a slave owner. They thought, you own slaves, you're a secessionist, you're the enemy. And that is the way they treated them all. Pardon? Yes. So the question was asked, did he get the land back after the war? The land was returned to all the homeowners. And the Army finally in 1865 decided, we do owe these people some compensation for using their land. They had built large numbers of timber buildings around all the forts, barracks, mess halls, prisons, all sorts of things, settlers, and they decided to offer those buildings to the landowners as their only compensation. Now, I guess around 70% of the landowners said, okay, we'll take that deal, because A, timber was expensive and it was valuable, and despite the heartfelt letter from Barney Swart, it was more valuable to the army than it was to him. They needed this timber. And in the course of the war, about 20,000 acres of timber in Washington County was cut down for military use. It forever changed the landscape of our, our uh, district here. So yes, they did get their land back. Most took uh, the buildings as compensation. Those that didn't, their only uh, course was to file a war claim, and of those war claims, most were denied. Okay, so there's specific things that I want us to focus on before we move forward here in this letter, which is quite compelling, isn't it? Under a military necessity of which I do not complain. So he acknowledges the need for the forts to protect the city, defend the Union. This Washington, D.C. is the symbol of the Union. It must be defended at all costs, strategically, and then politically, the president, the War Department is here. This is the center and nerve of the Union war effort here. Hundreds of thousands of federal troops will be organized, supplied, and trained in Washington and sent out to the field armies. So this is the nucleus. This is the center of the federal line. And as this gentleman brought up in the rear here, can justify the destruction before my eyes by soldiers and contrabands of the very wood, contraband, former slaves, tens of thousands of them are coming into federal lines during the course of the Civil War. Which is interesting because if they're coming from Virginia, they're happily being accepted in the federal lines because Virginia is in rebellion against the United States. That's also military necessity. I mean, you're contraband, you're seizing enemy property, which is those slaves are considered property, right? You're seizing their property, which they could use as military goods or services, right? Contraband decision. So throughout the Civil War, they classify African-Americans running into federal lines as contraband. The issue here is Maryland. 
as we talked about at the bottom of the hill here, Maryland is in the Union. It's a border state. The Fugitive Slave Act is still intact. You can still use it. So I've been looking through the records of the interactions between soldiers and formerly enslaved African Americans, and the accounts are absolutely incredible. They're coming into federal lines, and the soldiers start taking them in. And then the slave owners run after them. The slave owners are allowed to come into camp to retrieve their property. But that's when they come into the soldiers who provide the freedmen, as we call them, protection. So really, the, the end of slavery breaks out on the ground with the Union Army and African Americans fleeing into federal lines. Does that make sense? James McPherson talks about that. The end of slavery really is the breakdown when there's an alliance between federal soldiers and African Americans on the field, which is really important to understand. So the number is around 30 to 40, maybe as high as 50,000 African Americans coming to federal lines during the city. Um, we've been trying to do as much research as we can about that to reveal kind of the experiences of these people. Stay tuned for more. Are there any other questions before we move forward? Go ahead, Dave. Just to point out, because of the quartermaster's left this very nice little map to where the property that they were going to sell or get back to the landowners, <coughs> they left us a map of where their, uh, their, their buildings were. There were barracks, there was a uh, mess hall, there was uh, officers' quarters, and those were all right where we're standing. So we had one building here, uh, they set up on brick piers, uh, the other one was uh, on the other side of the road, and they had two, like four big buildings right in here and <coughs> under our feet. Right here. So, remember, this is the crest of the hill, the top of the hill where the main fort is built at. You can see that, and they're going to supplement these with the addition of batteries and other earthworks. Again, to the south of us is Military Road. Off to our east, you can see it dive down, is Rock Creek Valley, which is incredibly important strategically because they're fearful that the Confederate Army can slip through the defenses, go down Rock Creek Valley into the city, literally fall the creek all the way down to the interior of the city which we do on the Rock Creek Parkway, right? So there's that fear with that, and we'll see how the federal armies and engineers will remedy this. So as we go forward, we're gonna check out Fort Teresi, okay? And there will be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so look before us, we have a substantial mound of dirt. It's called a parapet in military jargon. Where did that dirt come from, you might ask? Oh, we have a ditch. <laughs> we have a ditch in front, which is the very definition of an earthwork. It's an excavation. You dig all the dirt out here, and you pile it up on a big high mound of earth here, which you can hide behind and put your guns behind, and nobody can shoot you as long as you hide behind it. Now, it's a, it's a a, a dual obstacle to the enemy is if they would attack this fort, and it's even deeper in front, they have to come down in this ditch, which is another six feet deeper, and then scramble up the wall, which is another six feet higher, because that six feet is over the years sort of settled down in here. So you can see it would be a, sta a substantial uh, obstacle to any attacker, and uh, why the forts were so effective throughout the war, they're all built on a similar concept of the excavation, the ditch and the mound of earth, but the size and the scale and all varies according to the topography and the use that this the forts and batteries were put to. So We've got the fort itself, right, the hole right in the wall there is the sally port or the rear entrance of the fort. That's where the soldiers will enter the fort at. The soldiers themselves, as we mentioned earlier, did not actually, not actually live in the fort. They had wooden, well, tents and then wooden barracks built uh, behind the fort itself. I was actually just going through the records at the National Archives. The soldiers in the forts did target practice twice a week, Tuesday and Saturday. So, I did try to sleep in on Saturday here, okay? So, Unfortunately, there are no historic images of Fort Terusi. There are some sketches here, which are quite telling. And I'm gonna walk around and let everyone see this from soldiers that were here. We can tell this is an early war image because of the tents here. But this is an image of, sketch of Fort Terusi by a soldier, might have been an Ohio regiment, I can't recall, during the Civil War. 
Does everyone notice what's in the foreground there? Stumps. The tree stumps. So we know the tree stumps went down. We know the forest around the fort is about 150 years old. Because they cleared the trees to build the forts. And you can see the trees have gone through the walls again. They've regrown through the walls. And they also had a clear field of fire fronting the fort, um, fronting the front of the fort as well. So you can see the Confederate Army from three, four, five miles away. Okay. <laughs> clear field of fire and they're testing these guns constantly over the course of about three or four years when the Confederate Army gets here in 1864. How far did the cannons reach? How far? Did it depends. Uh, one of the cannons here was a 100 pound Parrot rifle. It could fire about three and a half to four miles. A 100 pound shell and that will be in action during the battle. I want to show you how big this artillery shell is. Whoa. It's absolutely massive. There was a 100 pound Parrot rifle mounted in the northeast bastion of the fort here and it was engaged during the battle of fort stevens in 1864. this gun itself fired about 38 rounds during the battle the forts fired over 100 rounds during the course of the battle there's going to be a lot of skirmishing basically soldiers in front of the fort basically shooting at each other the main confederate thrust will be along georgia avenue or the seventh street road against fort stevens so Next week, we're actually doing a hike from Fort Jerusalem all the way to Fort Stevens, and we'll finish with the program there. And don't worry, we're not walking all the way back. That's a heck of a hike. There's going to be a school bus waiting for us there, okay? So next week, the program will specifically talk about Fort Jerusalem and Fort Stevens during the Battle of Fort Stevens, okay? Is Fort Stevens the biggest fort around here? Actually, the biggest fort north of the Potomac River will actually be at Fort Reno, the highest point in Washington, D.C. There are no remnants of that left. But the reason why there's so much action at Fort Stevens is because it's right on the road there. And the Confederate Army is coming down Silver Spring. So one thing I want everyone to kind of recognize here is there's a system of fortifications here. The forts are built 800 to 1,000 yards apart. Because you saw those really big guns, they can provide what they call mutual battery support. So if you attack one fort, you're going to take fire from several different directions. Specific example, when the Confederate Army is coming down both sides of Georgia Avenue, south towards Fort Stevens, they're taking fire from Fort Stevens. Off to their left will be Fort Slocum. They're taking fire there. And think about the Totten Metro Station. Fort Totten also has a 100-pound Parrot rifle, and they're lobbing shells this way. Fort Jerusalem is firing shells this way, so they're getting hit on three different sides here. That's the power of the defenses of Washington. And we'll talk about that more next week, okay? Did the, but, did the Confederates or the Union have any portable mortars? Portable mortars, no. But the, the soldiers actually here in the fortifications did have about 100 mortars around all the defenses of Washington here. So if they're taking... Inches, there were portable mortars, cohorns. Yeah. Uh, those, I don't know that they were used here during the fight. No, not, used, not using them during the fight. So one thing I also want to show is... Let's talk about names here. DeRussi is a famous military name. Uh, the older gentleman up at the top of the paper is the father. His brother was actually a Brigadier General in the Confederate Army. And his son was here with the New York Regiment and they built the fort in 1861. And he actually commanded troops in the Arlington Line during the Battle of Fort Stevens. Okay, so we're gonna have to change it up here, little folks. We're, I intended on taking people to the front of the fort, but since we're running out of time, we want to show people the batteries, take people up the battery cell, okay? One, one question, with the trees, with everything cut down, um, d d were, did the same kinds of trees grow back? And what started to grow back, are they what we see now? Or have the trees changed over time? There's this whole thing, I guess, called forest succession where the plants can change. What happened wow. after they cut down everything? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, that big old cherry That's a great question. And not a native to, cherry and might have been planted in that. To quickly respond, okay. I'm not sure. And okay. um, they've done actually some sort of studies up here with botanists and things like that. But um, we'll um, I'll have to dive more into that next okay. time, OK? Yes, we have a garrison here. No. No, the fort had about a 200 yard perimeter. It was expanded during the course of the Civil War. Um, had about, what, eight or nine guns? Most importantly, the mounting of the 100 pound parrot rifle makes this a very, very strong site here. The garrison is going to number less than 200 guys.
okay? You've got infantry guys that carry their rifle <coughs> that are in the rifle pits around the forts. What they really need are the guys that can command the guns, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's a Pennsylvania mm -hmm. unit commanding the guns here during the Battle of Fort Stevens. And uh, maybe that question, uh, I got this question. Where was Rock Creek Park founded? Oh, that's a great question. 1890. Question? When was Rock Creek Park established? That's why this is here, folks. We're very fortunate to have any of this left. Because just look across the street and see the high school over there and see all that development. Uh, there was a Civil War battery there, and it was wiped out over the course of the past century or so, right? Mm -hmm. So we're fortunate to have this. The majority of the forts, and I'll talk about that at the, at the end of the program, uh, were returned to the landowners after the war, and unsurprisingly, uh, they knocked the walls down. They went back to farming. They went back to you know, produce and building their properties and things like that. Modernity took over, and including Fort Stevens, by the way. It looked less than this by the early 1900s. Into the 1930s, you could see a little bit left of the walls. They uh, dedicated a plaque out there where Lincoln was at. That was reconstructed by the CCC in the 1930s. So we have all these unique stories in regards to the defenses of Washington. But this fort is relatively intact, as is Fort Totten. The next battery, there's not much there, but wait till you see the other batteries that we have left on the program here, okay? Is this the biggest surviving Circle Fort? <laughs> I think Fort Totten is. Totten is, yeah. All right, folks, we've got to get moving here. Follow me on the trail, okay? Poppy still, okay? And I've got other maps to pass on. Here we go, I'm passing out. So I'm gonna pass a couple maps around. If you have your maps on you, Look for Battery Kingsbury, okay? <laughs> We're looking for Battery Kingsbury. Go ahead and pass it around if you got your map. I've got another one. Here you go. You can pass it back. Pass this one back, please. <laughs> it's not. Fort Stevens is just up, up the road over there. All right, the last of the stragglers are coming up. By the way, so I had to look back at one point along the trail. If you read accounts from Civil War soldiers of the armies moving, they talk about being on high ground and seeing like snakes basically move through the hills. I saw a snake, and it was pretty cool. So, okay, if, if you look at your maps there, I passed out on a lot of them. People have got the paper ones as well. Look for Fort DeRussi, and then look southeast, and you'll see Battery Kingsbury. And we're going to talk, be talking about Civil War batteries now, because every, if everyone looks behind us, Fort DeRussi is on top of the hill over there. We can't see it. It can't see us. There's a major blind spot in this area over here. So one of the reasons why this battery is built right where Dave is at is because they're covering not only the blind spot for Fort DeRussi, meaning its rear end and its flank, but also Rock Creek Valley as well. The creek is right at the bottom of the hill. So imagine if Confederate horsemen or soldiers are skirmishing or moving down the line here, south into the city, these guns cover the creek, okay? So I had a, some questions asking me, What's the difference between a Civil War battery and a Civil War fort? A Civil War battery is an unclosed cannon position. And you'll see this very vividly at the battery left of Rock Creek, my favorite name ever, <laughs> right over there, okay? So let me read to you a short description from uh, the officers here of what a battery was. So General McClellan, the first commander of the, all the forces around this area in 1861 and early 1862, says, The intermediate points between the forts were occupied by lunettes, lunettes readouts, and batteries. In a few cases, these were, were united by infantry parapets, or trenches. The entire circumference of the city was thus protected. So think about this. You've got the main fort itself. You've got earthworks or rifle pits that will connect to the other fort and in between those you'll have an artillery position. Does that make sense? You've just got cannons filling in the gaps and more and more batteries will be added by 1862 into 1863. Uh, the one thing we could not show you at the top of Fort Jerusi there, it was, it's on the natural crest of the ground. If you go to the front of the fort, you cannot see the bottom of the ridge there. 
So we're on the natural, we're at, now we're on the military crest, meaning that the guns command the ridge, okay? So you've got the main fort and then you've got all these additional auxiliary positions. Does that make sense? That's why they built these. And before I turn it over to Dave, we're gonna talk about who this is named after. So unfortunately, if you had something named after you in the defenses of Washington, you were likely killed in action, unfortunately. <laughs> so, this, general right, this gentleman right here, a pretty, uh, a pretty common background, he was a career military officer, fairly young, served in the artillery, was promoted to colonel in a, was a Connecticut regiment. This is Henry Kingsbury, he was killed on September 17th, 1862. Does that ring a bell? He was killed at Antietam. Mm -hmm. And Dave, where is he buried at? So he's in Washington, D.C. So we are doing, and the Rock Creek Cemetery as well, and all these congressional cemeteries as well. So I'm throwing that out there. Expect some Civil War uh, cemetery tours in Washington, D.C., okay? All right, Dave, we better hear your voice. Talk about Battery Kingsbury. Uh, Kingsbury, uh, the, the, the battery named after Mr. Kingsbury. It was shaped like an L lying down, and the long portion of the L you can see coming through the tree right here, coming right up to where I'm standing, and the short portion of the L goes to the right where you all are standing. And in the in the Park right Service's there. wisdom, we put the trail right through it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the you know, trail has literally been built through the battery. You can see it curves down here. So one thing we want you to notice, folks, if it looks like there's some sort of human activity on the, the earth there, it probably was. So this little bit of land right here, that's a part of Battery Kingsbury. So let me tell you a really funny story. When I first came out here and Dave gave me these maps, I could not find Battery Kingsbury, especially during the summertime because there's all this green and brush and stuff. And what did Dave tell me? squint your eyes and look a little bit closer so <laughs> we're squinting our eyes and we can see remnants of battery kingsbury right here okay from the fort there's no ditch up front you can see on your own time and when you're out here on a walk you can look around the corner here and you can see the nice slope that the front of the fort made there were nine fairly substantial guns in here um, but this was dug from the back. You see this flat area back here? All the dirt was carved out here and then piled up here. This was this wall running down here was a good five to five and a half feet high. All that dirt came from right back in there. So we will see across the way there at the battery to the left of Rock Creek yes. uh, a similar, a very similar battery that's in very good condition. So you won't have to use as much imagination there. <laughs> okay, folks, as we move forward here, kind of a quick stay here, because we have to descend the hill. We're going to be crossing by Rock Creek Park, excuse me, the Rock Creek itself. We'll be, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll be showing the route of Military Road, actually, which will actually go south down Joyce right there, okay? And then we're going to do a little steep climb up to Battery Sill, and then Apparently they ran out of names and they called the last battery Battery Left of Rock Creek, okay? <laughs> My favorite name in the entire defense of Washington. So, we're getting back on the... Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there was a guy named Left, okay? So, <laughs> that's the first time I made that joke, I like it. So, watch your feet as we go down, just follow the ranger and we're gonna tr truck on. Our <laughs> yes. Makes you wonder how he survived for five years and just how did he support his family. Oh, absolutely. Did the Jerusalem's pass? No. They actually survived. Yeah, at the beginning of the war, like, Fort Stevens was originally Fort Massachusetts, and then they named it after General Stevens. Fort Pennsylvania became Fort uh, Reno, right? They started changing the names, right? And we'll talk about that in a second.
It did not fall over the bridge here, actually. It curved downhill and went across this bridge right over here. Oh, or, uh, a bridge that was in that area. You see? Makes sense they're going to go to the lower part of the ground, right? And so military road will east-west, go a little bit south, and then curve down and cross the creek right here. Dave and I were out here yesterday looking to see if we can find any remnants of the original bridge and stuff. There's nothing left. So. Without us like scuba diving, so. It was a wooden bridge, I think. Probably. Yeah. But I'm still trying to find a specific account of the soldiers dragging that 100 pound cannon up the hill there, right? The cannons were absolutely massive. And um, I'm trying to remember how much the barrel weighed, but over 10,000 pounds. So. <clears throat> What's up? That's right. So I kind of wish they left the cannons in place, but. Uh. Are there any cannons left? Um, yeah, there's a couple at Fort Marcy. And actually a great example of them leaving cannons is at Fort Foot. The massive 15 inch Rodman guns that are yeah. they're built right on the river. The barrels weigh 49,000 pounds. Where is it? Fort Foot is in Fort Washington, Maryland. And these, those guns can penetrate ironclad gunships in the Confederate Navy. And those guns, they kept the forts around, some of them until the 1870s. And the army took off and just left them on the ground. They were remounted by the Park Service about 40 years ago. Okay, folks, welcome. So we're very scenic area of Rock Creek Park. Right in front of us again, north is Military Road. The new or modern Military Road for the visitors that just joined us um, from the rear the actual military road during the Civil War is kind of the same route we took. It curved down this hill right here, crossed around, and went across the bridge. So there was an original bridge right where that modern bridge is at. Okay, so that's the um, old and new, I guess, military road in a way. So I want you to notice a couple things here. Fort Jerusi up there, Battery Kingsbury, a little bit southeast of it, right, right on top of the creek. You can see it now and we're on relatively flatter ground, lower elevation, perfect area for a Confederate incursion into Washington, D.C. Directly south, just following the creek into Washington, D.C. So if you look south of us on top of the high ground there, that will be our end destination. It's probably my favorite spot in Rock Creek Park, battery left of Rock Creek in spectacular condition. So if you look at the map, it's sitting right on top of the hill there. You got Battery Kingsbury right there, and we're about to ascend the hill right across the east side of the creek. I'm just Battery Kingsbury, Rock Creek. That's Battery Sill. So a triple crossfire here. Does that make sense? You've got guns from three different batteries pointed right on top of the creek. So if they're coming this way, they're going to take a lot of hot lead. Okay, Dave, you want to add anything? Well, Come on up here, uh, Dave. Records date is July 29, 1864. Uh, it says uh, eight pieces, uh, six light pieces should be added to the work replaced in Battery Kingsbury and in a battery now under construction overlooking the bridge on Rock Creek. That's the battery up there that was under construction uh, late on the scene, therefore, I guess it didn't have someone to name it after yet. <laughs> it was left. The modern bridge is where, where the uh, the wooden bridge uh, built by the military was to carry this piece of uh, the military road right down here. Um, Joyce Road goes up the hill on the other side. That is a continuation of the original project. Going back in. Okay, folks. So you're gonna have to follow us uh, single file. We're gonna go across the road. Um, walk across the bridge, and then we're gonna just just follow us on top of the hill there, okay? The wood. Because we're gonna go a little bit further up. <laughs> but we're very very close. As I said, one must use their imagination out here, okay? <laughs> Don't worry, we're setting up with the cherry on top when we go to the battery to the left of Rock Creek. And I must say this, uh, my friend Alex, who's been with me for almost three years now, he counted the number of people in attendance, 115. It's the biggest non-anniversary program we've had, so give yourselves a hand. So cheers to the Park Service and cheers to everyone that came out to the program here, okay? So my friends, as I said, we're going to go a little bit further up, and there's actually two sections of Battery Sill, an upper section and a lower section. 
we'll show you the remnants of the lower section as I spoke to a couple of people that came up with me uh, up with me here earlier a few minutes ago the upper section is um, it's got a large house on top of it now okay uh, no longer on pro uh, on park property but uh, since everyone's kind of gathered up if you have a chance to drink a little bit of water please do so and we're gonna go a little bit further up here about a hundred yards and we'll be right there okay so follow me up Jens, can you clear kind of a path right here? You're right on top of my battery. Oh, 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 <laughs> got these old uh, Civil War glasses. Uh, That's right. Uh, bottle, bottle. Okay, friends, so especially as we start moving downhill, you can really look up and see it. This is the remnant. If you look at your map, there's two sections of battery still. The lower section right here, the upper section is right up along the road there where a property is at, literally okay. sitting right on top of it. This is battery still. You can see the movement in the soil right here. Yeah, you want to talk about it real quick? Oh, sure. Yeah. Dave, turn around. Dave, turn around. <laughs> One second. I'm getting myself oriented. Okay. <laughs> you see the mound of earth right up there? Underneath that log. Yeah. Stretching that way. It's stretching back. That is, and there's a carved out area in the back of it. That is the remnant of battery still, the lower battery. Lower battery. Uh, <laughs> I did the survey about six years ago and we wrote battery still off entirely. It's not there. It's gone. Uh, because they were, I was looking in the wrong spot. <laughs> but when we got the, this nice LIDAR, which gives us this, the hill shade and the elevation, and we laid over here and started looking uh, where the historic map showed the battery should be, it fell right down on the top of this very suspicious pile of dirt, which obviously worked by humans. And uh, 1892 map it shows it here still and with a with a small house but it almost right up against it so behind here there's a lot of brick and things from, from the house but this is definitely the remnant of battery still you're the first people other than who us you and me okay and uh part to see yours. battery still and the stand and if you look at the location in terms of an artilleryman and you have this point all the way around of 240 degrees all the way around, shooting, covering that valley. Uh, the battery we're going to next, directly across from here, from here, and that battery, they had a wonderful crossfire uh, down on uh, Rock Creek. Nobody was coming past that. Nobody was coming up that way. Uh, so that, that was the, the, the upper part of the battery. There's a house, a large house standing on it right now. But when you stand there, you see why it's there too, because it has the same sort of sweeping views out in the panorama. Yep, so think you about it. You why they built the house there too. <laughs> Indeed. So it can sweep across the field and really cover the valley here. And then remember, these guns are working in unison, right? So you've got guns firing from literally three different angles right on top of the creek there. And so let's talk about who was here. And I must say, I mean, for Dave and I and us Civil War Earthwork, folks this is spectacular <laughs> to a lot of people it might look like a pile of dirt and brush but to us <laughs> this is super fascinating so has anyone been to Fort Sill Oklahoma before yeah. right? so I know people in the military we might have people in the military it's named after Brigadier General Joshua Sill a very young officer I believe he was 29 when he was killed in action like a lot of the soldiers officers he went to West Point served in the regular army and he served with the army of the Cumberland at the Battle of Stones River which is also a national park site Stones River National Battlefield in Murfreesboro uh, Tennessee that's actually where I went to grad school was MTSU so I spent a lot of time at this battlefield and his commanding officer was no none other than Philip Sheridan when Philip oh. Sheridan was serving out west and commanding infantry soldiers he was one of his brigade officers so this is a really interesting, unique story because on the morning of December 31st, 1862, the last day of the new year, the Confederate Army of Tennessee under Braxton Bragg will launch an attack against the Union right flank and will crumble it all the way towards <laughs> Stones River. There's going to be heavy fighting and they're going to be thrown right in the midst of it and Brigadier General Joshua Sill will be killed in action. He is from Chillicothe, Ohio. And I worked at a park in Ohio, and I've actually seen where he was removed to. But there's an interesting aspect of his story. Apparently, uh, the night before the battle, they were hanging around the campfire, Sheridan and his brigade commanders. 
and the next morning they heard some firing they grabbed each other's coats so he was wearing Sheridan's general officer's jacket in battle when he was killed it's an incredible story and his jacket or coat is preserved at the Chillicothe Historical Society okay so one of the things we like to talk about is we want to put a human face on all of this right I mean we've got the soldiers and laborers white black freed and slave working on these sites but these are renamed for a reason to honor the people that were killed in action in defense of the United States okay so we honor Joshua so after the Civil War when Philip Sheridan heads out west and command of the, uh, the, the Department of the Missouri or Department of the West he's gonna rename a military installation Fort Sill after his really good friend Fort Sill remains the largest artillery um, infrastructure or installation in the world so there is still a civil war connection there okay are there any questions when was it renamed 1868 i believe so just a few years after the civil war <coughs> grant will be president by then right uh, sherman takes over for grant and then they give a third star to sheridan and they just keep on moving up the line there okay so and sheridan were actually uh, classmates at west point 18 class of 1850 so they just all knew each other so they went way back how did so, these forts uh, communicate with each other to coordinate their firing? Okay, so the question was how did these forts communicate with each other? A couple of different ways. Pretty simply, courier, you know, they're writing, the officers are writing notes to their staff officers and they write off. And then, most easily for the defenses, they've got the flag, signal flags. So they're signaling back and forth. Um, almost each site has a signal station so they can com communicate back and forth to each other. So, imagine this in 1864. When the Confederate Army is literally coming down Wisconsin Avenue towards D.C., their first place that sees them is where? Fort Reno. Mm -hmm. Because not only is it the highest point in D.C., there's also a signal tower built there. They could see the Confederate Army, what, 15, 20 miles away by the dust columns, okay? You got a question? So that, we get that question quite a bit, and if uh, you, you recall what Bob said as we were moving up towards Fort Jerusi about how many trees they cut down, everything. 20,000 acres of trees during the war, everything. Clear field of fire here, and just imagine, I mean, if you look, if you look at the images of some of the forts, you've got the walls themselves built out of dirt, and then they'll reinforce them with either horizontal wooden planking or vertical wooden posts. The magazines where they store the ammunition will be, the infrastructure will be wooden posts as well. So they're using an incredible amount of wood. And then barracks, mess halls, kitchens, field hospitals are all going to be built out of these wooden structures, okay? So every tree in sight was cut down. And just imagine, go camping. How many Civil War, Civil War version of barbed wire, which would not be admitted for a few years after the Civil War. So something they called abati, which they used the trees to do. They pile all the trees facing the enemy with the branches facing the enemy, and interlace uh, the branches, and then somebody would go out with a hatchet and sharpen all the branches. So it, it created a, a hedge in many in many places, in a penetrable hedge. The idea was to slow down any attacker so they could be fired okay, upon. And the whole valley of Rock Creek was filled with an abati. It was interesting. So I was doing more research at the National Archives, and general orders is when orders are sent out from headquarters, right? And the, the Department of Washington, as they called it, is designated as the Department of Washington 22nd Army Corps. So you've got the department structure, the units in the structure or department is called the 22nd Corps. Those will be the troops fighting at Washington, D.C. during the battle in 1864. What's interesting is I saw a, a general orders in 1863 in 1864, specifically from this guy who has incredible facial hair, <laughs> Jennifer Christopher Columbus Auger, he's in command of all the troops and forts in DC, telling his officers that they must get written permission to cut down trees around the forts. Did they listen? <laughs> no, they did not. So, soldiers need firewood. And we talked about this other account from Mr. Swart. Contrabands are in around the forts now too. Um, there's refugee camps all over the city filled with thousands of formerly enslaved African Americans. So they need wood as well, right? So anything of use will be knocked down. Bob, you had a quick story? Yeah, just one thing about cutting down the trees at the beginning of the war. 
what they would do was the tree cutting crews would start at the bottom of the hill, cut three quarters of the way right. through, keep going up the hill till they got to the top. And then knock one down and they oh, all fall down in a row. And then they take out the stumps, which is much harder. And the soldiers were actually given a, a ration of whiskey for their day's labor. Hey, why not, right? <laughs> a couple of darts, a couple uh, shots, and they're, they're good to go. So, um, go ahead, Dave. Yes? While we're on trees, uh, the map from the Coast and Geodetic Survey from 1892 of this area uh, does show it, it completely denuded of trees. Uh, that's, it shows the remnants of uh, battery sill, upper and lower, and the house back here. But it also shows, you see these very large line of trees that run down the hill like that? Now that shows up on that 1892 map. Everything else is cut down, but it shows this line of trees run down there. And we surmise that that was a property line. And they left the trees there. So you can still follow that. On a good day, you can follow the property line, read that in the ground. How, how much of this was open farmland anyway? Uh, not much. Yeah. Hmm. We, we go back to Bushke map. I don't have that. Yeah, we, we didn't see much farm. No, it was, it but around there. Fort Stevens, it, it was more farm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's there level, there. level land up there. Question, sir. Right over here. I will stand on it. Don't hurt yourself, Dave, please. You think I'm going to hurt myself? Walking the carpet. Yeah. Yeah, so this is going to be a special treat as we descend downhill and go up the seed battery left of Rock Creek. You're going to see what this really looks like. So one other question I generally get a lot, because a lot of these batteries were unarmed, meaning if the city was in imminent danger, the forts would start firing their, their cannons off, right? And they would bring up artillery, light artillery from the city to reinforce these positions here. So were these filled with guns during the Battle of Fort Stevens? I have no doubt. Because just in case the Confederate Army slipped through Rock Creek Valley in the D.C., there had to be artillery pieces here. They also barricaded Rock Creek Valley during the war as well. Felled trees and things like that. So the Confederate Army will be north of us, north of Military Road. There's going to be some action, as I said, in front of Fort Jerusi and the earthworks connecting them. But the main action will be at Fort Jeru uh, Stevens on down to Fort Slocum, where the main sector of fighting will be at. And by July 11th, the afternoon, in the early evening, remnants of the Union Army of the Potomac will come up from Virginia to reinforce the city. And we believe we have found some of their earthworks out in the woods there, okay? So, I think this is really cool. <laughs> Wait till you see the next session. Yes, sir. Quick question. <laughs> I have not found accounts that they received fire, okay? Okay, folks, so I'm going to shift up to the front. We're going to march back downhill, cross the uh, creek, and go up to the battery, okay? Yes, Sergeant. And a bunch of Marines, like 40 Marines that controlled the fort when the war began. That was it. <laughs> and his job was to make sure no one in there went in there to mess with the, uh, with the black powder. So that was it. Good <clears throat> question. How long did it say, or say, how long did it take to make more reports? Within a span of a couple of weeks, a few weeks. Okay. And, and, but they're constantly enhancing them, right. right? That was their goal. They're constantly enhancing them. Like Earthworks, absolutely. Go down to like, um, go down to the, um, uh, the Yorktown area, you know, a, a, a lot, the funny thing, a lot of those were actually uh, enhanced during the Civil War by both sides. But yeah, they're, they're, there's always been earthworks. And people can just go in and, and anyone can dig, right, and hide behind walls of dirt. I mean, it's, it's a good defensive position, right? And it's also, I know more people are coming, but people ask, like, why didn't they use stone or brick and stuff? Well, these are only temporary. Remember, Bar Barnard says these are temporary for the national emergency, right? So when the war is over, they can just knock them back down, right? <clears throat> and re relatively speaking, watch the road, sir. There's a biker coming out. Um, they were re relatively cheap, right? You can just go out there and just start digging up, right? And by the time the Civil War is in its second and third year, uh, there's heavy artillery used, especially down at the old brick fortifications that are knocking the walls down. So these walls could absorb heavy artillery.
All right, folks, let's go up the hill there, okay? And we'll take you to the right. It is a beautiful day, yeah. Thank goodness we didn't go out a couple weeks ago. That would have been miserable out here. So. We have would have had a lot of desertion, I'll tell you that. So. What's up? No, not at all. Not at all. All right, catch your breath, friends. We're almost done, okay? We're going to show you one of my favorite historic features in the defense of Washington. And something a little bit further up the road that Dave thinks it's specific to the Battle of Fort Stevens. So really incredible. And then um, we'll head back up, okay? Tom, I said about 12.30. Um, you do want to see this next part, but if you have to break off early, we completely understand. All you have to do is follow the trail back up. This will take you to the horse center, and adjacent to the horse center is the nature center, okay? But we don't have any deserters in this group, okay? They call them uh, shirkers during the Civil War, okay? So when battle was imminent, these guys would like kind of disappear. And then the next morning, they show up for roll call. Hey, we're back! So, okay. So, my friends, this is a very, very special site. We're talking about all the batteries. This will finally, it all comes together out here. You can clearly see what a battery looks like, why it's specifically and designed and placed in this specific area here. We don't really um, promote this area too much because it's right off the trail. People have been walking and by this for well over 100 years now, right? Rock Creek was established in 1890. People have continually gone up and down. Uh, people from the horses have come up and down and no one knows that it's out here. We kind of want to keep it out like that, all right? So we, we likely won't put interpretive wayside or anything out there. We generally do this for formal programs where you can come out and see these incredible earthworks. So, Fort Tarusi, Battery Kingsbury, Military Road, Rock Creek, <coughs> Battery Sill right across the way, and then my favorite, Battery Left of Rock Creek. Follow me in, folks. The, the botanist told us that she wants us to kind of remain on the outside because we don't want to bring in seeds and stuff like that, okay? Invasive things like that. So just follow me up. We'll check it out, okay? Poor battlefield, especially in Virginia, and like this will start popping out, right? Like, oh, I think there's something there. Okay, my friends, is everyone up? A couple more stragglers coming in. Everyone's done very well, by the way. Yeah, this has been very, very impressive. A large crowd. We're all getting each other's way, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it slows us down. But I think if everyone could just look north here, look how spectacular this this cultural feature is, right? I mean, look at the amount of dirt that was excavated from this site here. I'll let Dave talk about that in a second. Yeah. Dave will go ahead and go on in there. I'm going to be the human pointer. He's the human pointer. So there's a couple things I want everyone to notice here. And you hear this in fortification terms, embrasure is the gun opening. Do we see gun openings here? Yeah. Yes, we do. So how many do you see there? One, two, three, four, five, six. A full Union Civil War artillery had how many guns? Six guns. Meaning likely, this was likely unarmed. Meaning during the, uh, the prior to the battle, artillery was sent up from the city, the, her the horses drew them in, could reverse and put the guns into place. So this is what we call a Civil War battery. What do you think? Yeah. Spectacular, isn't it? Dave, go ahead. Uh, well, this reinforces the idea that all earthworks are excavations. And you can see exactly where they got the dirt to pile up into those mounds. And that's right here. You can see where they, this is the burrow pit right back here. They started digging right back that way it's unlike the major forts where the ditch was on the outside exterior ditch in this case they did an interior uh, excavation because of the lay of the land uh, when you come back around that way you can sort of look across the front and see why they couldn't it was just eroded out on them. They dug a ditch in front. So all the earth came from here you can see this nice flat area here and you come up here just a little bit this step, this here. Yep. You can see a slight change in elevation, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, these are the gun platforms. This is where the, the planks were laid 
uh, to hold the gun. And in pink, in fact, you can almost see right here. You get the guns up on the platforms, they had a little ramp. A little ramp came right here. See, Dave's got those eyes, right? <laughs> He's only been doing this for like 40 years. So. <laughs> Put the gun right here, pointing through the embrasure. The embrasure at a 45 degree angle. You can see still that angle. That's why these are so nicely preserved. From these embrasures, you can see that 45 degree angle. And that's kind of rare. It usually just erodes all the way. Did it survive? Uh, it did. Uh, this is the main battery, part of the battery. We walked in along the left wing of it. That was for infantry, check the battery. And there's a right wing over here too, with the road passing through. But it had two infantry wings off the side of it. Artillery here. <laughs> they put their horses and everything down behind the hill. You guys have any questions about this? So we don't want to bring people forward because we want to keep as many people off the earthworks as possible. If the, if the camera's not there. If the guns are all at 45 degrees, right? On the on the embrasures, do they shoot every? How do they adjust where they're shooting? They can adjust in between that. They have they're limited to that 45 degrees. Yeah, left or right. They go left and right, but yeah. still going to go the same distance. They can go to the left or right within that 45. Yeah. Okay. And they can shoot. Uh, and a lot of times now, by this time of the war, the embrasures were designed so that if, if, they, if these guns fired out the embrasure that they like they were supposed to, it would. Crossfire is the, the, the port over here. This engineers are thinking mathematically. They've got all these embrasures. Okay, this will work with this port, and this will work with that port. And so it's crossfire. What they do? Mathematics are John Bernard, one of the foremost mathematicians of the 19th, 19th century. Are there any other questions, folks? Yes, sir. Children. Probably like Napoleon's three inch ordnance rifles. Most likely, uh, I'm thinking mostly 12. We're not exactly sure what guns were up here. There's no... Um, they just said field guns. Field guns. So light artillery. Not the big guns at the forts, because those guns aren't moving, right? These ones could be carried by the field army. So when you go to Gettysburg and you see 12-pounders and Napoleons and 3-inch ordnance rifles, these are the guns that they would have moved up here. You could drag them up, put them into place. I'm thinking Napoleons, because they could use a lot of canister fire here if necessary on infantry and cavalrymen as well, okay? And so probably yes. what, what they had available too. That's right. Fine, sir. Pennsylvania troops as well. Not sure. Yeah, not sure. Um, it's important to understand, and this will take us to our final cherry on top spot or end of the tour here, is the Sixth Army Corps, the famed soldiers from the Army of the Potomac that came in to reinforce the garrison here, will be filling in the line between Fort Stevens all the way to Fort Jerusi and around this area. So you'll have veteran troops in this area behind the forts. These are the soldiers on the evening of July 12th, around six o'clock, that will launch the attack to drive the Confederate Army out of the city. So the forts actually do their jobs during the Battle of Fort Stevens, but it will take the veteran soldiers to actually leave the forts, move up north, and drive the Confederate Army out. So if you've ever been to Battleground National Cemetery on Georgia Avenue, that's actually where my office is at. That's a battlefield. They call it battleground for a reason. On both sides of Georgia Avenue is where the Battle of Fort Stevens will end. But do we believe that there were troops and cannons in this area during the civil during the battle in July '64? I think without a doubt. Did anybody ever march up Rock Creek? Did, they, did the Confederates ever use that? There were some accounts that try? said that there were Confederate cavalry that like maybe passed south of Military Road. Probably never fired from here. Yeah. In I fact, it was under construction still at the end of July. Yeah, 64. so I don't believe so. Question, sir. With shovels, how long did it take to build this? Yeah, we had that question earlier. Um, within a span of a couple weeks. I mean, you had hundreds of soldiers out here constantly working. And so I want, I want to show you this evolution as well, okay? So the first builders of the forts will be the soldiers themselves. 1861 into early 1862. Think about the Army of the Potomac, right? The main Union Army in the Eastern Theater, they're in D.C. They're building these forts. When they leave to go fight in Virginia, they're going to bring in a mix of civilian laborers, including formerly enslaved African Americans. And there's going to be other soldiers that come in to fill their places, mostly heavy artillery units and other infantry that will expand the forts. So these constantly grow. So a perfect example is Fort Jerusi. They expanded the fort by about 40 more yards in 1862, 1863, 
and they added the 100 pound parrot rifle as well. A lot of these batteries will be added in 1862, mostly 1863. Span of maybe a few weeks. That's all. I mean, the biggest thing is cutting down the trees, right? And then you just got soldiers digging. Anything else, Dave? Uh, a, nor a normal soldier could move about a, a cubic yard and a half in a, in a, in a work shift. Mm -hmm. So they could figure out how many men, 100 men. You're, you're moving a lot of earth pretty quickly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then they come in with the afterwards with the planking, the retention, uh, retention walls on the back of here. That mound, shapeless mound there would have been straight up and down in the back. Uh, there would have been uh, some uh, planking along those embrasures, outlining it. And uh, the, the planks for the gun platforms were all inserted. So the, so was, the one thing we're going to show you at the end, which is extremely unique, I, I've been walking by this for a couple mm -hmm. years until Dave pointed it out. Yeah. And I want to show you this great contrast, okay? We've got the defenses of Washington, which are relatively static, right? They're going to remain in place. They'll have soldiers go out and do probes and scout the countryside and things like that. But the defenses remain in place. What you're going to see there will be, we believe, constructed by the veteran reinforcements that came up to secure the city. Six Corps. Which clearly shows, if you know anything about the fighting in Virginia in 1864, it's absolutely brutal, bloody, some of the worst fighting of the Civil War. And wherever the armies are going, Robert E. Lee's armies, Grant's armies, they're digging entrenchments, right? They're digging entrenchments as a precursor to like the Petersburg campaign in Virginia. We're going to see field works over here. You've got defensive works here, and then you've got temporary field works. Absolutely spectacular. Any other questions, folks? Yes. We see the nice embrasures of this battery. The two previous batteries. Did they have embrasures that have since eroded, or did they never? Have battery still, I'm not sure about, but uh, Kingsbury had had embrasures. Yep. Yeah. So and I think the one thing we can really, survived. you can really see here is how important like preservation is, right? For a couple, of, for a number of reasons, of course. I mean, Rock Creek Park being established in 1890, like what, 25 or 26 years before the National Park Service is even created. Um, but you know, modernity happens, right? People move on, things are knocked down, people rebuild again, right? So the idea that we have any of this, we're very, very fortunate. Okay. All right, folks. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, and I'll speak about that real quick until we, until we go to our, our final site. So um, I suggest people, if you're on Facebook, follow our Facebook page because I, um, I, when I went to the National Archives this past week, I found the end of the defenses of Washington. And was I close to crying? Yes, I was. Okay. <laughs> so they sent out general orders in April, the end of April of 1865. So think about that. The war is not officially over yet, right? But Lee had surrendered. Um, the other armies that were in the process of surrendering. Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated, right? The culmination of the war is finally coming to its conclusion. And so what they end up doing is there's an official organization called the Defenses of Washington. All the forts around D.C., that's abandoned. It's over. The Defenses of Washington will be disbanded. This will remain the Department of Washington, but the garrison in Washington as well, that's all gone. So the forts... There's about, what, 68 of them by the end of the war. By 1866, they keep about 20 of them around just in case anything happens, including Fort Stevens over there, mm -hmm. Fort Totten, Fort Reno, some of the forts in Virginia. But by March of 1866, the government's like, we're not paying for these anymore because they have to maintain these. So that's the thing we didn't mention as well. It spends a lot of manpower maintaining these earthworks, right? They're made out of earth. Out of earth so they will erode over the course of the, the year, especially with weather and things like that. So by March of 1866, the forts are completely disbanded. All the soldiers are sent home. There are some forts that will be kept around. Fort Foot will be kept around until about 1874. It's a very, very unique site. They're, they start experimenting with concrete out there, disappearing carriages or depressing carriages. It's the precursor of what we call the Endicott battery Endicott system. Batteries, yeah. If you've gone out to the American <clears throat> shoreline, east or west, you see those reinforced concrete like bunkers that had those famous disappearing guns. That's a precursor. They're trying to figure out what to do next in regards to coastal defense. If you go down to Fort Washington, I'm leading a program there in March, hint, hint. We'll talk about the batteries out there as well. Fort okay? Hunt too, some nice yep. Endicott batteries. Um, what else was around? Fort Whipple was kept around. That's where the Signal Corps was headquartered. We now call that Fort Meyer. So it's still an installation, right? And Fort Washington as well. 
which is obviously a different structure made out of brick. Before the Civil War, that was kept into action and was reactivated um, during World War I and World War II. Okay? Good question. But Basically the majority of the training. forts are gone. Fort Foot was reacted, uh, reactivated for briefly for training purposes. There were still a couple of buildings left over there. <clears throat> okay, my friend. So we'll go to the final spot here, and then um, we'll get you back to the visitor center, okay? We'll, we'll conclude the program right around here, okay? When I first came up along here, I just spent... Uh, a couple of weeks down in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, that's where the final siege of, of the war in Virginia was carried on for nine months. Uh, they did a whole lot of digging down there, uh, hundreds of miles of uh, entrenchments. And uh, I was very surprised to see one of those Petersburg-like uh, entrenchments right here. Yeah. And it didn't make any sense. I, I could take this, drop it in a couple places down in Petersburg, Fit right in. In fact, there are emplacements just like this. It's really a, more of a command position. This is where officers were dug in. It had a little, this was a little bit fancy though, it had a, a pass through here, sort of like a, a little tunnel you crouch and go through, standing here. It probably had logs around it uh, set up and, and a slit in between that the officers could sit in here with their binoculars. And uh, they, they see everything going around. They see Fort DeRussi, uh, Kingsbury, this battery, still all the way up the valley. So the only explanation for an entrenchment of this type would be the Sixth Corps when they were here. They, by habit, that time of the war, they just dug in wherever they went. Uh, and you didn't waste a you, the only time you ate, you turned a lot of dirt first and wasted manpower was for, to, to protect your officers and to protect your artillery. Uh, and the, the infantrymen came after this. This is, this is a classic 1864 field entrenchment. Yeah, so let me provide a little bit more context here, okay? Okay, so, good. So, we got the battle in 1864 as the Confederate Army is surging from Frederick, Maryland. On July 9th, they fight elements of the Union Army at the Battle of Monocacy, right on the Monocacy River there. Our good old friend, General Lew Wallace, right, author of Ben-Hur, he's gonna make this heroic stand along the Monocacy River, trying to buy the Union High Command enough time to reinforce Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, okay? Because what's gonna happen in 1864 is General Grant's gonna come out here they're going to promote him to Lieutenant General and General in Chief of all the armies. He commands literally every single Union soldier in the country. And his job is to really end the war by the end of the year. Right? That's Lincoln's mandate to him. So I started looking through the records when I, when I did a program down by the Lincoln, excuse me, the Grant Memorial last year for History at Sunset. How many troops were sent out of D.C. over the course of the campaign? A lot. And this started as soon as Grant got to Washington. He asks General Halleck, who becomes his chief of staff, how many men are, are, are garrisoning the defenses of Washington? They say about 30,000 men. Over the course of the campaign beginning in May of 1864, they will strip the forts of about 25,000 men. 25,000 men will be taken from the forts to serve actively in the field with the armies. Why is that an issue? Well. Let's go back to the patron saint of the defense of Washington. General Barnard. I forgot to mention this, but in October of 1862, after the Maryland campaign, which results in the Battle of Antietam, right? September 17th, 1862, the bloodiest day in American history, federal engineers and the high command like, oh my gosh, the Confederate Army can march down from Maryland and strike the city, which will happen obviously in 1864. So what do they do? Well, they form a commission approved by the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, to literally, the commission is called the Commission to Study Defenses of Washington. And Barnard and all the other chiefs of the Army will ride around and take reports of all the forts over the span of about two or three months. They will issue and give the report to the Secretary of War, and this is what they say. The forts need to get bigger, especially on the Maryland side. We need to add larger caliber guns. 14 100-pound Parrot rifles are mounted. 
We need to defend the city from the river. Fort Foot and Battery Rogers are mounted with the 15-inch Rodman guns. And by the way, you need to keep about 34,000 men in the city at all times. He calls them permanent garrisons. 9,000 heavy artillery men. The men are specifically trained to fire the really big guns and about 25,000 infantry and even three or 4,000 cavalry as well. So close to 40,000 troops are supposed to be in the city at all times. You can see by 1864 how the war changes, right? Grant and Lincoln will literally put all the chips in the center of the table and says, we need to win the war now. So as Grant starts taking heavy casualties, they even further strip the forts to replenish his losses. And this gives the Confederate ar Army an opportunity to seize the initiative in a sense, right? By July or early June, actually, Lee is pinned against the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia. And 20 miles south is the critical railroad center or center Petersburg, Virginia, Richmond and Petersburg, right? So they'll start that 10 month long siege of Petersburg and Richmond. So Lee is literally trapped against both cities. So what's he gonna do? Well, it's an election year. Let's, let's do something. Let's apply a pressure to the Lincoln administration and the War Department. So they're gonna send Jubal Early up here with around 10 or 15,000 men through the Shenandoah Valley to cause havoc. And that's exactly what they do. It's only by July 5th or 6th when the Federal High Command, including General Grant in Petersburg, realizes that there's a large Confederate force north of the Potomac River. There's going to be an epic fight along the banks of the Monocacy, as I said, on July 9th. And the, one of the reasons why the Union Army is able to hold on for about eight to nine hours that day, reinforcements have already arrived on the field. There's oh, The third division of the 6th Corps under James Ricketts will be sent up literally the Potomac, Chesapeake and the Potomac River all the way till Baltimore and they are moved out by train to Monocacy and they fight at Monocacy according, according to General Wallace magnificently that day. But this is one of the rare battles where the Union Army is actually outgunned and outnumbered. They were driven off the field and General Wallace retreats all the way back to Baltimore and he literally writes Washington saying you will have to make every exertion to save Washington. So it becomes a race. The Confederate Army will step off to Washington on the morning of July 10th. Reinforcements are being sent up from Virginia, from the Union side, and who could get here first? Fortunately for the Federal High Command and the citizens of Washington, General Wallace delayed the Confederate Army by one full day. Okay, so on July 11th, 10, 11 o'clock, they're going to start moving down the 7th Street Road at the forts were lightly garrisoned at that point. We've got Ohio National Guard troops that signed up for 100 days, Veteran Reserve Corps, formerly called the Invalid Corps, and this is the famous battle where they arm government clerks and send them to the front line under Montgomery Meeks. So literally all hands on deck will be at this action here, okay? They're going to be, going to be fighting in front of Fort Stevens around 10, 12 o'clock, on July 11th, we believe uh, President Abraham Lincoln is at Fort Stevens observing the initial firefight. He is told that the 6th Corps has arrived off the Potomac River and he's going to go down and greet them as they enter the city. The soldiers write about meeting Abraham Lincoln. The citizens were giving food and water. A lot of people have heard this before on my program, but this is the famous, we believe, scenario. According to a Union soldier, where Abraham Lincoln tells the soldiers you can't be late if you want to get early, okay, as they race up because they're 